this day all your love all your power all your strength and now god we just ask that you stand in my body think with my mind preach with my lips let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be found acceptable in your sight oh lord you are my strength you are my redeemer in the matchless marvelous name that is above every name let everybody that loves jesus come on put your hands together and bless them Come on, come on, come on. Bless him like you love him. Come on. This is not Kansas City. This is not San Francisco. It's Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Grab your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts, the New Testament book of Acts. Also consider the Acts according to the Apostles or the Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 9. We're going to look at verse 36 through 43, continuing our theme for the 2020 No Limits sermon series to kick off our theme for this year, 2020 No Limits. Acts chapter 9, looking at verse 36 through 43. If you have it, say amen. amen. If you still look and say wait. All right now. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the Gospels, and they are the pillars of the church. Some theologians say the walls of the church, and Acts is the roof, and some of the flooring, and boards, and so forth. And so Acts chapter 9, looking at verse 36 to 43. I have a King James Bible, and my Bible reads thusly. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died. Who, when they had washed, they had laid her in the upper chamber. And for as much as Lida, Lida was now nigh to Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there they sent unto him two men desiring him that he would not delay to come to them Then Peter arose and went with them when he was come they brought him into the upper chamber and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing him the coats and the garments which Dorcas made while she was with them but Peter put them all forth or what he's talking about, put them all out, and kneeled down and prayed, turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. This is the word of God for the people of God. Blessed be the name of God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I just want to preach for a few minutes and help us transition into our annual conference. But I want to preach from the subject, Unleashing Unlimited Power. Unleashing unlimited power. Just talk to your neighbor on your right hand side and say, You got it. That power. Turn to the other one on the other side and say, You have it all. But you got to turn it loose. Unleashing unlimited power. When we first come to Jesus and are saved, we come to him under the influence of the world. Our sinful nature, which is nothing more than our trained independence from God, was in control of our lives. Our thinking was not in line with the word of God because our greatest influence was the systems of the world ruled by the enemy. Do I have a witness? 
Consequently, our behavior was worldly. Yet, when we surrendered ourselves to God, we died to our sinful nature and became new creations, freely given the Spirit of God and the mind of Christ. The problem, however, the problem, however, is when we get saved, nobody push the clear button to erase our old way of thinking and acting. Consequently, we become saved, but our thinking and behavior remain under the familiar spirit of our past influencers. The world and the ruler of the world, or the prince of the air, uh, is that one I'm talking about. So we can continue to struggle with the same things we struggled with before we got saved. Why? Because we are still listening to the voice of the enemy instead of the voice of God. You'll stay with me. I'm trying to set this up now. Whenever the Lord speaks, his voice has a particular sound. His voice will always be, listen, full of grace, truth, and love. The best way for us to know whose voice we are listening to, and this is one of the questions I always get asked as pastors for those who want to know and discern the voice of God, how we do the best way to know whose voice we are listening to is to take note of our emotions. Emotions, listen, follow thought. But they ain't great followers, but terrible leaders. I'll say that again. Emotions follow thought. And those emotions are great followers, but terrible leaders. Why? Because God has given us emotions as indicators to help us know what is happening with our thinking. Feelings of stress, worry, anxiety, fear, and doubt lets us know that we aren't hearing or being influenced by the voice of God. Instead of our old habits and patterns of thoughts are still governing our lives. So when God's voice is dominant in our patterns of thinking, we will experience love, joy, peace, and patience, and kindness, and faithfulness, and goodness, and self-control. These fruits of the Spirit mm -hmm, in a maturing Christian are maintained and sustained. Although we are under attack by the enemy, as we begin to advance the cause of Christ in the earth, saving souls, strengthening saints, serving society, healing the sick, and raising the dead. And so we, we're battling constantly, but even while I'm battling, I'm still in the spirit with God because I'm listening to his voice. And listen, I know his voice. And discerning his voice, what the enemy does, and he gets us so emotionally pinned down, we can't really hear the spirit and what the spirit of God is trying to tell us to do. Do I have witness? And so pay attention to your indicators, because if you're constantly in anxiety, constantly full of worry, constantly full of fear, constantly full of doubt, uh, you're still being influenced by your carnal nature. And the enemy will use everything to keep you distracted. I'm trying to work this slowly now. And so in the book of Acts, we see the church, the church individually, the church corporately, unleashing the unlimited power that the church today in 2020 still should be operating in and is given to do the work of God in the earth. All of us uh, have the great privilege to join God in the earth in what he is doing. And oftentimes, we want God to join us with what we are doing. And that becomes the problem. Mm -hmm. And so the church is now in the text born and is moving out of the confinements of Judaism and religiosity with all forms and fashion and tradition and control, reflecting a new abiding power linked to the intimacy and the directions from God. Uh, this, this is uh, why it's controlling and, 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 and controlling us because we're trying to find out who voice is in control. And then through the book of Acts, you constantly see mature Christians or maturing Christians listening and praying for direction. Uh, this is a church that's full of grace and truth, love, and, and now sustain 
same displays of power on a continuum power constantly miracles constantly yoke breaking constantly the move of god constantly happening and the early church had none of the advantages that some ministries boast of and depend on today. Uh, their church of the old uh, didn't have it all that we have today. They didn't have AC and carpet. They didn't have microphones. Uh, they didn't have big budgets. Come on, some. Uh, they didn't have big budgets provided by wealthy donors and mega church attendance. Their pastors lacked the credentials from accepted schools. They didn't have seminary training. Nor did they have the endorsements of the influential political leaders of their day. Uh, most of their ministers had, had jail or criminal records. Uh, and probably have a hard time today joining our churches, let alone leading them. Do I have a witness? What, 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 but what is really the secret of this uneducated, sometimey jail record church? Here in Book of, Book of Acts, what's what's the real secret of their sec, to success? Uh, that the Christians of the early church knew how to pray, mm. so that the hand of God could work in in mighty power. And listen, they knew how to pray on one accord. Yeah. Right? They didn't have the leader calling times of prayer and twenty percent of the people participating. Do I have a witness? They didn't have moments of prayer when, when half the leaders participate. They were on one accord. And when you're on one accord, the power of God is released to do the works of God. And so many of us want our family members saved and delivered, want, want the, the, the demons in their life to be sat down, but we don't fast and pray to see it happen. Please, Pastor Maxwell. When, when asked to explain the secret of his remarkable ministry, the noted British preacher Charles Hayden Spurgeon replied, my people pray for me. St. Augustine said, pray as though everything depended on God and work as though everything depended on you. Prayer is not an escape of responsibility. It is our response to God's ability. True prayer energizes us for service and for battle. Do you realize you are in a battle? And if your church is calling for prayers for 21 days, you ought to join your church because you need to be equipped for the battle. And the battle is real. And sometimes we don't realize how real it is to it come to our house. Our children are wayward and, and addiction is taking place and our money is funny. That's, that's when we start praying. Mm -hmm. And so that the church armed with prayer and the gospel of Jesus Christ has unlimited power. And that is positioned to be unleashed by the disciples who know God's voice and is not distracted by the enemy in all his temptations and carnal ways. Uh, a weak church is a distracted church. A weak church is a gossipy church. A weak church leaders are sometimey and half-hearted and non-participatory. A weak church is a prayerless church. A weak church is a wordless church. A weak church preaches everything but Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. A weak church hearts of those who worship are convoluted and, and divided. And that's what the enemy wants. A weak church. And sometimes you got to be glad that God's given you a church that prays. A church that studies the word. Or a church uh, that stands for the gospel. A church that evangelizes and go outside the doors to preach the gospel, to witness, to share. You ought to be glad that God has given you a safe place to grow in. I don't know about you, but I'm glad about each friendship right now. I'm glad about our church. We are all that we need to be, but God ain't finished with us yet. He's still working on us. Come on, somebody. He's still working on us. Hallelujah. And there is one thing stronger than all the armies of the world, wrote the French poet and novelist Victor Hugo. He said, and that, that, that is an idea whose time has come. An idea whose time has come is stronger than all the armies in the world. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is much more than an idea. The gospel is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, according to Romans 1 and 16. 
It is God's dynamite for breaking down sin's barriers and setting the prisoners free. You want to change a neighborhood and a community? Give them the gospel of Jesus Christ from praying minds and praying hearts. You want to change your house? Uh, open up the gospel of Jesus Christ in your home and read the word. Uh, you want to change your mind? Read the word on a daily basis. and It'll change your mind and it'll change your heart. Uh, it's time had come, and the church in the book of Acts was on the move. Look at that church, constantly moving. The salt was now leaving the Jerusalem salt shaker to spread all over Judea and Samaria, just as the Lord commanded in Acts 1 and 8. And Acts chapter 9 opens with the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, the leading persecutor of the Christians, which was perhaps one of the greatest events in church history after the coming of the spirit of Pentecost on the day of Pentecost. The next great event would be the conversion of the Gentiles in Acts 10. Stay with me now. And Saul, whose name was changed to Paul, would become the apostle to the Gentiles. So God had to get Paul straight and converted from Saul to Paul. Then he can win the Gentiles, which include all of us in this room today. Uh, uh -huh. and, and, and Saul, whose name was changed to Paul, he became the leading apostle to the Gentiles. So God, listen, was working his plan to bring the gospel to the entire world. Why am I saying this? Because you can be Saul and, and you can be changed to Paul too. Uh, you can be Saline and changed to Pauline. God is constantly working on his plan. We're not in this sanctuary right now uh, by accidents. We're here by providence because God is working uh, on his plan and you're part of his plan. God, in the opening of Acts chapter 9, converts Saul, uh, the high horse persecutor, into Paul, the lowly preacher. Now fully ready to preach the, to the Gentiles. God has waiting on deck to present a dynamic duel of power with a brother named Peter. Yes, I'm talking about that denying, knife-carrying, quick-talking uh, Peter uh, who claimed, who was claimed by the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, uh, where he preached so hard, 3,000 souls were added to the church. Peter now in the text is moving about as the church is moving uh, and engaged in an itinerant ministry. He, he's preaching all over town. Uh, Acts 8 and 25 says uh, he was visiting the saints at Lydda. Uh, a largely Gentile city about 25 miles from Jerusalem. It is a city uh, Philip the evangelist had already plowed. And some people plant, some people plow, and God always gives the increase. And so we see Philip the evangelist had already been there, setting up that Peter may come. And so from Acts 9, 32 and 35, we see miracle after miracle. miracle. We see the great miracle of healing Aeneas. Uh, the resurrected Christ, uh, and by the authority of his name, Peter wields a sword that brings Aeneas uh, to salvation and brings him from uh, uh, to a place of healing. Mm -hmm. uh, then the great, greater miracle of the text today uh, is which the raising of the dead daughter Dorcas in Joppa located on the sea coast 10 miles from Lydia. And if y'all were with me uh, on Facebook Live, I, I did the whole book of Jonah twice during the 21 days, talking about the significance of Joppa. Uh, so because the greater miracle happens later on in chapter 10. So we see healing uh, of a a a a Aeneas, then we see the resurrection of the dead of Dorcas, but then the greater miracle uh, happens in chapter 10, the recording the salvation of all the Gentiles. It is here we see Peter using the keys of the kingdom for the third and last time. Uh, Peter had opened the door of faith to the Jews in Acts chapter 2 and for the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. And now he's being used of God to bring the Gentiles to the church. But here in verse 36 and 43, in Joppa, the same city that was the place where the pouting prophet Jonah fled to, when he tried to flee from God to avoid going to the Gentiles. Uh, uh, he didn't want, Jonah didn't want uh, uh, any Gentiles, particularly those in Nineveh, uh, Assyrians who were his enemy. He didn't want them to be saved. 
Uh, he didn't want them to come to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he was pouting, and so he ran from Joppa to go down to Tarshish. Uh, so he didn't want to uh, get anybody a uh, saved, especially those who must have persecuted him as their seniors. But I want you to know when I stop by here to tell somebody, God don't care who you are. God don't care who your background is. God don't care what color you are. God don't care the hair that you raise all night long. God don't care who you're sleeping with. He still want to save you. He still want to redeem you. He still want to claim you as his own. He still want to change lives. He still want to heal you. Salvation doesn't have walls and barriers. It doesn't care who you are. As long as there's air in your body and you're still kicking some dirt up, he wants you to be saved and sanctified and the Holy Ghost fear and fire baptized. So now, now, now Joppa is the place Peter received received his call to, to the Gentiles. So because Jonah disobeyed God, the Lord sent a storm that caused the Gentile sailors to fear God. Now in this text, because Peter obeyed God, God sent the wind of the Spirit to the Gentiles that they experienced great joy and peace. What is the contrast between Jonah and Peter? Same God, same wind. Uh, here, here's what I, what I want to land. It's simple. What does each friendship want? Storms that keep rocking the boat of your life? Causing everything to be a wreck? A hot mess? Chaotic or unstable? Full of fear and uncertainty? Or do you want the wind of the spirit? The, the, the wind of the spirit with dead things, dead marriages, dead finances, dead relationships, dead dreams and visions come alive and have new life. Again, same God, same wind, Numa, Ruah, uh, same place, same time. Which one do you want in your life? Do you want God to send storms in your life? All of us have some storms, right? Storms come and storms go. You either coming in a storm, right? Getting ready to go through a storm or you're in a storm or you're coming out of a storm. The difference is, which one did God send? And, and if the storm I'm in, is it because of some disobedience in my life? Because if, if God loves you and me, he will correct us. And sometimes, storms will cause you to call on the Lord. Storms will cause you to, to correct your behavior. Storms will have you speaking in tongues, crying out to the Lord. Storms will change the way you think. Storms will break some things down. People that you don't want to see, all of a sudden you're dependent on some of the same people that you don't have nothing to do. But when 9-11 and all those catastrophes happened, more people came to church, more blacks and whites were getting along, talking to one another, because storms make you one people. Which do you want? Do you want Jonah who, who disobeys that God has to send wind and storms to get him to, to be converted? Or do you want the Spirit of God? The, the Spirit of God. See, one comes uh, uh, out of rebellion, and I'm not going to do what I want to do. Uh, I, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it, no matter what other people think. Fleeing from the presence of God, fleeing from the word of God. Uh, I'm not surrendering my life. I don't care. Uh, that's one of the storms uh, that, that Jonah had to deal with. But the other comes from, listen, a surrendered life. A submission to the call. An obedient servant following his God and his mission. But both of these happened in Joppa. Jonah ran from God and his responsibility. Can I say something about that real quick? When you run from God, you're also running from your responsibility. Because God does not call you or draw you without giving you some responsibility. He doesn't save you to sit. He saved you to work. Do I have a witness? Right? And, 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 and literally, Jonah's disobedience almost killed everyone and everything connected to him. But Peter here in the text ran toward God. And when he, because he ran toward God and communed with God, uh, he had the unleashing of unlimited power to raise Dorcas. Y'all, y'all, y'all gonna get it in a minute. You see, he, he had resurrected power in him, the same resurrection power that Peter has. Every disciple in this room right now has access to that same power uh, to be able to resurrect a Dorcas, a community, a people, and their hope in Jesus. One unleashing power of destruction 
and judgment, the other unleashing unlimited power given to the church to raise up the sons and daughters of God to do his bidding. That's what it's all about. Power given to the church to do God's work and God's bidding. Power not to make you look good. Not to build your reputation. And not, not, not to get you a, a lot of churches to go preach to. No power uh, so you can do God's work in the earth. And there is a tragedy right here in the text. Did you see the tragedy in the text? Dorcas, who's also called Tabitha, died. She not just died, she died right at the height of her ministry. She wasn't just any kind of some tommy kind of girl. She had so much influence in her community because she not only made clothes and visit the sick, she knocked on doors and dropped food off. She consistently served everybody in Lottie Dottie. She was some kind of Christian woman. She was a praying woman. And at the height of her ministry, she got sick and immediately was gone. Somebody say immediately. There was no chance to even check on her or see her. Uh, Dorcas, who was called Tabitha, as all of a sudden she's gone. And the loss of a choice saint, a choice saint who carried a central part of ministry is one of the most difficult things to replace. And let me just say as a pastor, I, I, many times I don't have a chance to grieve all those who are lost. But our church has lost some choice saints. And it ain't easy coming back to the pulpit to preach again, to teach again. Because so many saints crossing over. And, and, and it's not easy to begin when our children are lost or when our mothers and fathers are lost. And loss is real. And we, whether we know it or not, we have a grieving church right now. Because there's so much loss in the last two to three years, it's enough to make somebody's hearts totally break. And so we see darkest loss. It's so hard to replace. So when the believers heard that Peter was in Joppa, they knowing that Jesus Christ is the resurrection, knowing that Peter is connected to Jesus, knowing that there's some kind of power uh, in Peter, they said, let me go call Peter. And they, they, ran, to, uh, they ran to find Peter immediately, uh, and they sent for him. And bear in mind, there is no record in Acts that any other of the apostles raised the dead up to that point. So their sending for Peter was an evidence of their faith in the unlimited power of the risen Jesus. Their faith is not in Peter's power. Their faith is in the power that's in Peter. Let's get it twisted. And too often, we give him credit and we so feel and attach to pastors... And, it, and you don't need to be attached to people and pastors and leaders so attached to them you ought to be attached to the Jesus Christ that should be in them because if, they, if I don't have Christ in me don't follow me go somewhere else come on somebody stop being attached to people be attached to the power of God that's resting inside of their life and so they called Peter they called Peter because they knew there was power to make a difference there was power to change things around there was power not in Peter but in the power that dwells in Peter the risen and resurrected Christ power operating through the spirit of God working it out in Peter anybody want that power today? that power is available to every believer if you believe that power is available and so Peter Peter had the power and Peter was one who they can depend on who believe and so he raised the dead so why would he not be able to raise the dead well, why would Peter not be able to raise the dead right from his Jesus raised the dead when he ministered on the earth for 33 years so if Jesus raised the dead over the 33 years so why he not able to raise the dead from his exalted throne in glory? Using his bodies on earth called the church. Jesus, while he was on the earth, human and divine, had the spirit had to come down upon him. Then he began to heal. But he has flesh. 
but now he's on the right hand side of the father making intercession for us which means every one of us when we pray we have access to the power of God when we pray in Jesus name you don't pray in Jesus because Jesus is on the right hand side so you gotta she said I, I am the way to the father so you gotta say in Jesus name to get it kind of in there uh, and so when you begin to really pray and know God's voice and discern his voice uh, you begin to be able to do some things beyond your capacity beyond your talents and your abilities but we got to learn how to be the church that's in the book of Acts and be the church of the Acts in 2020 mm -hmm. and so Peter had the power to heal and he used the power to glorify God and to help people not to promote himself when Peter showed up the, we the weeping widows were, uh, who was impacted by Dorcas ministry was in the room crying their eyes out. Uh, they were grieving and crying over this young lady who has such an anointing on her life that, 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 that did so many things of great service for her church and her community. This Dorcas, this servant of the Most High God is now gone and they were weeping in the room. And so Dorcas provided so many resources for the hurting and for the broken. There was no government aid, no Medicare, and no, no Medicaid in that, power, uh, in that time. The only thing they had was power. Uh, they, they, they didn't have no government programs. They, they didn't have uh, all the uh, commutements, what do they call them things? <laughs> they didn't have all the comfort. All they had was the power of God. That's my sermon. If you and me and us and we, if we're going to become what God wants to be in the earth right now in this Northeast church, we're going to stop, stop relying on other outside resources and rely on inside resources. Rely on the inside resources for the same sanctified and Holy Ghost filled. Rely on the inside resources. The one who stretched wide and hung high and died who came down 40 and two generations, now dwells in us for, for the inside resources, the, the, the baptized power of the Holy Ghost, giving you the evidence of not only tongues, uh, but all kinds of gifts for the body to be able to do great exploits in the name of Jesus, to rely on inside power, uh, the power of the blood of Jesus that still works uh, in, in 2020, uh, inside power, the power to heal the sick and to raise the dead, uh, to be a church that can make a difference uh, in the world. We can't make a difference without that inside power. Power uh, for the Christ uh, who walked the earth for 33 years, had stretched wide and hung high on the cross, uh, uh, put in a ball tomb, and on the third day, raised up out of the grave with all power in his hand. We got to have inside power. And so I believe that God is calling us, every individual saint, not to be stressed out, not to be worried, uh, not to be all broken and busted and disgusted, not uh, being defeated, not being caught up in all of our feelings only, but to take those feelings in the measure whether we are really connected to God. They're real feelings. Don't deny them. But there's something more beyond all the feelings. It's the truth and the grace and the love of God who wants to free you to be able to do the great works of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! Anybody want to do the great works? I want to do the great works of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's all I want. I, I want to help the Dorcas. I, I want to help those in Joppa. Uh, Jonah didn't want to go there, but Peter said, I'm going down to Joppa. Uh, I want to go wherever God sends me. Is there anybody here want to go wherever God sends me? I'm willing to go, God. Come on, stand to your feet and give him a blessing right now. Come on, bless the Lord right now in the house. Come on, bless him the way you love him. Bless him for being so good. Bless her for the inside power. Bless her for the inside power. I can. I will. There's unlimited power in God. Not my power, but the unlimited power of God. Thank you for the unlimited power of God. It's an inside job. Thank you. Father, I thank you, God, for what you have done to prepare the church of antiquity now even in 2020 all these centuries later that same power is available to every believer who will rely not on their carnal nature not on carnal people but rely on the holy spirit's power 
the name of Jesus Christ, the word of God, and the instruments we need to do ministry. God, I know you have so much more in mind for each friendship. So I'm praying in the name of Jesus, you touch every family member, every disciple that's here, and their children and their children's children. Hold up in your hands the weeping women and men who cry in tears that nobody see because of loss, because of tragedy, because of a broken heart. God, I pray for healing for them right now in the name of Jesus. Continue to lift their countenance and let them know how much we love them and are standing with them. God, I pray that you bless our church even now in the matchless, marvelous name of Jesus. And everybody that got two hands, come on, give them a hand clap of praise. Unleash the power. Unleash.